So, if I were to divide this room into two, and I want a show of hands from everyone, please, you have to choose. You can either be a fox or you can be a hedgehog. There is no third option. Who would prefer to be a fox? And who would prefer to be a hedgehog? Yeah, I think the fox is just about winning it. I confess that uh, when I was first asked this question, I had exactly the same response because it's kind of cooler and Fantastic Mr. Fox was kind of fun. Uh, there was a really interesting uh, piece of work uh, in the 1950s by a philosopher called Isaiah Berlin, and he borrowed the story of uh, this unpronounceable man, Archilochus, uh, who was a poet from about two and a half thousand years ago, who said, a fox knows many things, but a hedgehog knows one important thing. Now, what it means for us in business is that we need to be much more like the hedgehog than we do like the fox, because the hedgehog is particularly good at one incredibly simple thing. It's able to do a small thing really well over and over and over again. Whereas a fox like, gets very excited by all sorts of different ideas, and you probably have people like this in your, your organization, fabulously creative, you need people like this, but they'll bounce around and get very excited about lots of different things, and it doesn't always help when you need one central strategic direction. So, that's why you need to be a hedgehog. Hedgehogs are cooler than foxes. Look it up, it's a fact. The one thing that you need to know as the hedgehog in your organization, if you are a sales leader or you have a plan to be a sales leader at some point, is this framework. Predictable, scalable, repeatable. And I tend to shorten it in order to remember what I'm talking about to prescript. In other words, is your business, is the machine that you're building, will you be able to go on holiday for two weeks and when you come back, the engine is still running. Could you go away for four weeks and the engine is still running? Can you build an engine that continues to roll when you are not there? If you think about uh, the highest end of strategic leadership, the kind of position that you want to be in is the Napoleon position. You want to be seated at the table while the battle is raging around you, eating your dinner, and the journalist says to you, why are you not at the battle? And your answer is because the generals all know exactly what they have to do and the strategy is in place, and people only come and talk to me if there is a problem. You need to have a predictable model. But it's not enough, because building a predictable model, building an engine, maybe you can tow one tonne, maybe you can tow two tonnes, maybe you can tow three tonnes. Can you tow again and again and again? No, you have to make it scalable. You have to put the model in a place where it's able to consistently replicate itself and grow. In other words, you have to systemize and industrialize your process. And the third thing you need to do, and it's where we are at Ametria right now, is to take the um, predictable, scalable model that you've built and make that repeatable. Can you do it in a different category? Can you do it in a different market? Can you take it to a new territory and make it operate? Can you take that thing that you've built and transfer it and make it work? This is the single most important framework that you can possibly work on. And the subject of this talk is going to be about frameworks, frameworks for growth in order to generate that uh, hypergrowth machine, and specifically, that predictable, scalable, repeatable, repeatable model is the core. It's the most important thing you can possibly do. Now, in my role at Metrio and other roles before, I've spent a lot of time interviewing C-level people. Every time someone comes to join the C-level team, various people on our C-level team will interview those people. And I can't tell you the amount of times when I've sat down for lunch with someone and asked them about their frameworks They've had to do that thing that you will spot in interviews all the time. You see it with everybody. They look at the ceiling, they look up, they think of something intelligent to say, and then they hit you with the answer they just made up on the spot. Right? Now, nothing wrong with this. As sales leaders, of course, we want to hire people that can fire from the hip. We want to hire people that are able to handle difficult questions and deliver them well. Maybe one of you asks me a question at the end of this, and I haven't considered it before. I will probably need to look at the ceiling and think of the answer. But when you ask a leader about frameworks, they should know. So, for example, when I would ask a CTO about their frameworks, I will say to them, what is your coaching framework? How do you take junior engineers and coach them to the point where they are able to scale up and be senior engineers? Now, anyone who's able to go to a CTO level interview will be able to answer that question, but most people cannot talk about a framework they've put together. 
This is an example of a basic pitch framework. So it doesn't really matter what this is, it's just an example. This is the seven point process that I have developed over the last 20 years or so for coaching young salespeople in how to deliver the mechanics of a pitch. There's an introduction, you must deliver credibility. You have to re-educate your audience. Uh, there needs to be some kind of fact find, we all call that a discovery. There needs to be a paradigm shift. You know, the uh, prospect must ask you to present rather than you. Uh, uh, is there a cat in the audience? It's you. <laughs> uh, there needs to be that paradigm shift. So this is just a process. It doesn't matter what it is, but you need to have all of these frameworks in place in order to be successful. Uh, but it's not just about making people adhere to a certain way of working. Pitch scorecarding is a fabulous way of coaching your entire team to the next level. If you have, as we do, a positioning deck, which has about 20 slides and takes about 15 minutes to deliver, then you will be able to score every single element of that, uh, uh, of that, um, of that presentation. And when you can do that systematically across your team, you will see for sure the areas where you didn't do a good enough job. What too many people do is assume that this is about punishing a salesperson for not delivering part of the pitch well could be the case, much more likely you didn't coach and train that area well, and you'll see those trends develop across your team. So that pitch framework is not just about, here's how I think you should pitch, guys. It's now, here's how I can coach you up to the next level. So I'm going to talk about three growth frameworks. Uh, here they are, objectives, people, and full funnel architecture. Now, there is only so much time today, so I'm not going to spend much time talking about objectives or people. We could do an entire day on objectives and goal setting. We could do an entire day on how you think about people, how you think about hiring for values, how you think about hiring for typology. Uh, I'm going to focus mostly on the third one, the full funnel architecture. And I think a lot of people don't think of this as the most important thing that they do. Most people think of their funnel as, once we've created an opportunity, and it closes, it goes through five or six stages in Salesforce, that is my funnel. Some of you may think a little further back about your leads and how those are developed. Some of you, if you handle customer success, will think about how the funnel operates uh, post-sale and how you move to upsell and, uh, to, and to avoid in churn. Full funnel architecture eventually is our job. It's to ensure that that predictable, scalable, repeatable model is going to work over and over again. So that's why I'm going to spend most of the time today. And what I've decided to do is just give three examples, some actionable insights that hopefully you can take away. I could have given you 50 examples, so I've chosen three. I hope they're useful. Let's start with objectives. Uh, raise your hand if your company has objectives or goals of one kind or another. So not everybody, but enough. Okay. We should talk about that afterwards. <laughs> Raise your hand if uh, you yourself have objectives other than your sales target. Of course, if you're a sales leader, you've probably got to hit a number. Raise your hand if you have other objectives. Okay, so maybe slightly less. Now, finally, raise your hand if you have personal objectives for yourself and personal development objectives for each one of your team, which is being tracked on a weekly basis. So a lot less. And that's because we always reduce personal objectives to, uh, sec uh, to second choice. We always take the one-to-ones that we have with our sales team and we talk about their sales, we talk about how they're going to achieve, and we forget that it's much more important to talk about their personal development. An intrinsically motivated person is more likely to achieve their target than someone who's just been grilled on their Salesforce administration, which, by the way, is always going to be bad. Uh, so the one point I'll make about objectives from the highest level is this book. Uh, I've already sat through a whole bunch of really interesting speeches where people have recommended books. Myself, I really struggle to read business books. I'm not a fan of them. Um, I find them highly irritating and they tend to make me feel pretty useless and stupid. However, this book is incredible and I highly recommend it. Measure What Matters uh, is written by the man who introduced OKRs, objectives and key results to Intel and then introduced them again to Google. Google is managed in this way. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is managed in this way. Simply about good objective setting, what are the key results to enable you to deliver that objective, and how do you consistently iterate those in order to be incredibly successful? I'm not going to go into any more detail, but I recommend that you read this book. If it's interesting to enough people, I'm sure somebody here can do a speech on this uh, subject at some point. The next thing is people. So I suspect that most of us here today are from a SaaS background. 
And if you think about your company, what is your company? It's two things. It's a load of lines of code, and it's a bunch of people, and it's nothing else. You haven't built anything. There's nothing physical. For some of you, maybe, Internet of Things, perhaps. But for most of us, we have a laptop, and we have individuals, and that's all that we've got. And let's assume for one moment that you've got your product engine working well, and you have a product that you're proud of and is delivering well. The only other thing that you should care about is your people. And all of us know that the way to achieve with people is to hire the best people you can possibly hire. And yet, how many of us have worked in organizations where that hasn't been done effectively, where there are people who may be wonderful and competent but are bad fits for our organization, or we are a bad fit for them, or they are unhappy, or they leave? This is because we hired badly. So frameworks around people development are incredibly important. For example, in, uh, when we are hiring individuals, uh, every interview that I do, including at the sea level and for the most junior individual, the first question we ask is always the same. And it can be quite disarming for candidates. It always makes them laugh because it embarrasses them ever so slightly. We always say, tell me a little bit about yourself. You've got two to three minutes to describe who you are, why you're amazing, why you could be a good match for Ametria. The second one tends to embarrass them, especially in the UK. US, they tend to be up for that. But <laughs> uh, who are you? What, in fact, we had a VP sales interview today in the US, and in the notes, our head of talent wrote, I'm really embarrassed to write this, but they said, I'm fucking awesome. <laughs> so don't tend to get that response in this country. So who are you? Why are you amazing? Why could you be a good match for Ametria? Now, not that complicated. We then say, but just one second, we've got your resume in front of us. Please don't read it, because we've already seen it. Just want you to talk about like, who, oh, excuse me, who you are. So then they really struggle, because now they can't use the uh, CV that they've prepared, so they have to think a little bit more deeply about who they are. We then have a scoring system we're looking for. First of all, do they cover all three points? I guarantee you that only one in 100 people will cover all three points successfully. They always manage the first one, eventually. They'll be able to talk about that. They often talk a little bit about why they're amazing, but if, I've never met an individual that doesn't have something that sets them apart and makes them interesting. People are just endlessly fascinating. There's always things that can be talked about, and yet so often they forget to do that, to talk about adversity that they face. They forget to do that because they're so intent on talking about their CV. We don't want these people. And the third thing is why Ametria. And we accept, of course, that you will be interviewing in all sorts of different places, but you should be able to articulate why you think our company is the place for you. When you've done those three things, we are also looking for a number of values that you've demonstrated when you spent two or three minutes talking about yourself. What level of self-awareness did you demonstrate? We score that. And a whole bunch of other values-based um, uh, underlying questions. It means once that first three minutes is out of the way, sometimes it lasts for 20 minutes, but once that first three minutes is out of the way, we have a really good understanding immediately of whether we want to hire that candidate. And then we ask a whole bunch of other questions which have a similar goal. All of this is a framework. If you ask the same question to every single person, you will be then able to evaluate correctly whether those pe how those people uh, relate to one another. Simply about having a framework, not about an intuition. If you sit in that meeting and you only have intuitions, you will hire for your bias and you'll hire some good people, some not so good people, they won't be related to your values, and you'll miss out on 70% of the market who could be wonderful for your customers but just isn't quite inside your sweet spot. Hiring the right people is more important than having the best idea. An average idea will be smashed by the best people, but an excellent idea will be trashed by a poorly put together team. In other words, you don't have to have a group of people that grew up spending their ent entire lives dreaming of the day they would be able to sell the product that you have. You do need to have exceptional people who can get behind the idea that you've got. And if you have that, you're more likely to win. So I want to spend a bit more time talking about full funnel architecture. And it's specifically three funnel frameworks. There are more than three. These are the three that I think are most interesting to talk about from the very beginning. So. Demand generation, how do you drive demand in your product? Incremental gains, how do you think about that uh, Dave Brailsford uh, British cycling team concept of adjusting every element of minutiae to optimize performance, knowing that every one thing you do will be hard to measure, but when you layer those things on top of one another, you will have driven success. And then data-driven uh, decision-making. So 
uh, when James asked me to speak, the first title of a speech that I gave to him was Lessons Learned from 100 Sales Director Interviews, but he didn't want that. I thought it was really good. And the reason I thought it was good is because uh, from September up until about February, I interviewed almost 90 sales directors for a position at Ometria. And only three people were genuinely able to demonstrate that they truly had data-driven decision-making. However, all 90 said that they had it. Of course they did. It would be odd to say that you didn't have this. Only three of them were able to go through every single set of questions we had on the frameworks that they were able to deliver and say, yes, I can do that. Now, even in those three, there were areas where they couldn't, but they were at least able to say, I don't think I've ever done that. That's why I'm here. I'd like to learn how to do those things. So everyone says they do it. Not everyone is able to do it. The example I've chosen for demand generation is around partnerships. And the reason I've chosen that is because the majority of sales leaders I know have been a, an SDR, and then they were an account executive, and then they did an enterprise, and uh, then they became a sales manager, and now they know, or they think they know, how to run a sales team. But they never thought about partnerships. And the reason this is so important is because this is a far more cost-effective way to drive uh, leads into your pipeline. And I've never seen an organization where this cannot be done. So what we've done at Ametria is uh, very quickly build a partnerships team. So Emily, who runs our partnerships, came with me from Triptees to Ametria. Uh, within nine months, we're already influencing or sourcing 25% of the opportunities we create from partnerships. So the framework that we put around this was three things. In our space, and I'm sure your spaces will be similar, in our space, we have, uh, we're in uh, retail e-commerce. We have e-commerce platforms, which uh, are the underpinning, they're the bedrock of almost everything an e-com retailer will buy. So Shopify, Magento, these are $10 billion businesses. We need to be able to form partnerships with those. Second category for us is uh, the, the space that we're in. Other tech players who are not directly competitive with us, but sell to similar people, they will be in their interests and in our interests to partner with them. And then there's a third category, which is all of the agencies, in our case, all of the tertiary players who are helping implementation inside e-com retailers. And there's one of these in every town. There are literally hundreds of them, really, really competent and great, but a lot of them all struggling to differentiate themselves against one another. So with Emily, we built a strategy. So who are you going to speak to? Who do you talk to first? So we built a strategy in the UK. We're now rolling it out in the US as well. What's critical about this is it drives shorter sales cycles. It drives shorter sales cycles because the partner is going to surface a lead which is most likely to close quickly. Whereas if you are doing only outbound, you may get lucky and find those people, but there's a very strong chance that you will also end up finding someone that just bought something a month ago and you're going to have to nurture and drip that, uh, that, uh, that lead for a year. A partner will surface someone that might be about to buy in two weeks' time. We have proven that we can drive a shorter sales cycle through partnerships. It's also quicker to scale. Imagine, as we are doing, imagine you open your office in New York. How do you get beyond the New York retailers? Well, an agency in New York is probably running business up and down the East Coast and perhaps a little bit into the West. So there will be surface and opportunities that help you get out of your beachhead and build your next beachhead in line with you know, uh, chasm thinking. And it's more cost effective. So our SDRs are wonderful. We're never going to stop building um, interest in SDR teams. But wouldn't it be much more useful if your SDR, when they call, we use a heat mapping um, thing. So when your SDR is calling the hottest lead on their list, wouldn't it be useful if that lead was coming through a partner? It means that uh, you need less SDRs, but those that you do are able to handle uh, hotter leads. Therefore, your CAC to LTV fee ratio is going to improve and as a SaaS business obviously if you want to raise really interesting funding at your B and C rounds and beyond then you're going to need to be in a position where you can prove that you're in top, the top quartile for all of the most important SaaS metrics. To do that you need to be able to drive efficiency, partnerships drive efficiency. What it's done for us at Metria is scale up opportunities. Remember at the beginning we talked about predictability, scalability, repeatability. So what we have now, you can see on this uh, chart, at the very beginning when I joined, we had seven or eight people inside the, uh, seven or eight opportunities being created inside the organization. Now we have about 25. I'm short on time, so I'm going to get through these, because I think these two are quite interesting for you. And uh, there is some time for questions at the end, so we'll just eat into the question time and, and go through that, if that's okay with you. Um, so this is a snapshot of our funnel at Ometria. Now, you can, what you can't see on here is the very top line, uh, which is an SDR needs to deliver between 250 to 320 touches a week, about 60 a day, in order for us to be successful. 
at a rate of 4.2%, that converts into meaningful conversations. We've defined what that is, so we have 13 meaningful conversations. That converts at a rate of 25% into discovery calls. So in other words, we have about three discoveries booked and held each week. We're then able to deliver two deep dives. So for us, that's, I guess, what you may call us uh, an SQL. It's a much deeper discovery call. And those two deep dives turn into one opportunity. One opportunity, also not on this chart, turns into half a deal. In other words, every two weeks, a deal is generated by an SDR. Our deal value is about 30 to 35,000 pounds. Therefore, every week, an SDR is delivering 17,000 pounds worth of value into the pipeline. But here's what happened when someone changed the process. So, still 13 meaningful conversations, still three discoveries taking place, but what specifically happened was we noticed that our SDRs were able to, in the meaningful conversation, keep someone on the line and continue to talk and do the discovery and call. Seems really sensible, doesn't it? You've got the guy on the line right now, let's talk to them at this moment. But what actually happened is there was, uh, they, the prospect didn't place enough weight on that call because it hadn't been uh, in the diary, because it wasn't calendarized, because they weren't expecting to do a 30 to 40 minute call. They just had a nice chat. And that meant that our deep dives went right down, even though at the top line, activity was still just as good. And that meant that we were only creating half an opportunity. So what you can see now, this is quite complicated, so I'll talk you through it. Left-hand side, you can see that we were adding 120 opportunities. Average deal size was 30,000 pounds. Win ratio 33%, so 120 times 30 is 3.6 million pounds worth of business going into the pipeline. Winning at a rate of 33% means we're winning 1.19 million pounds worth of business. When you scale up that one small marginal error, which sounds quite smart, instead you're only creating 67 opportunities. Same deal size, AEs still closing at exactly the same ratio, 33%. Only 2 million in the pipe, 663 closed, 50%. And then someone, a board, a CEO, a senior management team will say to you, oh, what the hell is going on? And unless you are deep into the framework of your uh, funnel, you will not have the faintest idea. That's why it's important. Finally, data-driven decision-making. Two minutes? <laughs> Two minutes, thank you. Finally, data-driven decision-making. So uh, this is an example from a previous startup I was in. I give this example because uh, the uh, deal size in my current business is pretty substantial. And we're doing some pretty large enterprise deals, but I was previously in a much more transactional business with lower deal values, therefore the volume has to be higher in order to make all the unit economics work. So what we have here is an analysis of win rates by age and by deal size. And you can see very clearly this number here, 71%. This was a complete revelation to me. I had no idea. Our overall win rates was running at 25%. But where we were able to close a deal for less than 10K in less than 10 days, we were winning seven times out of 10, and one of our reps was winning nine times out of 10. It's just unheard of. So we had a hypothesis. The hypothesis was, I wonder if we can pull some deals from this very healthy category, 34%, into here and retain that win rate. If we can do that, we'll be faster to market and we'll win more business. So this is what happened. Uh, that number dropped to 65%. So it went down, but only slightly, 6% drop, 65% win rate, two deals, one out of three. It's still pretty damn good, I think you'd all agree. So we managed to achieve that, but here's what the results were. Before, we had 13 deals closed. Afterwards, we had 24 deals closed. Before, in the second category, so try and keep up here, we had 21 deals closed. Afterward, only 12. In other words, we pulled Ford a large quantity of deals from here into this category here with a small drop in win rate. And that meant that even though we closed pretty much the same number of opportunities, because we closed them more quickly, the deal value for closed business went up by 20%. So if you want me to explain that in more detail, because I'm trying to go fast now, um, I will do so. In other words, the hypothesis we had, which is all about touch points, and I'll explain that too, enabled us to close our business more quickly because we were deep inside the detail of the pipeline. So what we actually did was hypothesize that the deals that moved quickly had incredible momentum. They had incredible momentum because certain salespeople were touching constantly to that account and drip feeding really interesting insight. Therefore, we started to measure momentum and that's what this chart that Cluster have provided with, uh, me with uh, does. It looks at how many um, days there are in the sales cycle and how many touch points you've had, how many meaningful touch points. 
and that means we can dig in uh, the, uh, the opportunities of fake, of course. Uh, but other than that, it demonstrates that you can monitor the momentum of a deal. When we monitor the momentum of the deal and delivered loads and loads of insights to the team in order for them to have something meaningful to say, it meant they pulled deals forward into that 10-day window and they were able to close them more effectively. In other words, smart frameworks deliver uh, really exciting results for the business. So just to give you an idea of how it's worked for us, uh, we are currently running at 107% growth rate. That's looking at the quarter we've just closed versus the same quarter one year before. And as you know, the magic number is 19% for quarter on quarter growth. You want to be able to deliver 19% growth because 19% growth uh, rolls out to 100% overall over the course of the year. So we ran at 20% up Q2 versus Q1 by this kind of framework. If you remember one thing, it's prescript, predictable. Have I got a machine that's predictable? Can I scale it? So that means constantly looking at the kind of nuances that we've just been looking at. And then can I repeat it? Can I take that and move it to another market? And I guess if there's anything else you should take away, it's, it is much cooler to be an expert at one simple thing, which is this machine, i.e. being a hedgehog, than it is to be kind of good at all sorts of different things. Thank you. Thank you.